Hello guys, so today we are going to do something a little bit different. So we are going to watch together a documentary about physical commodity trader. So this documentary has been released on the two th in 2013. Uh, I think this is the best one so far that explains really well what a commodity trader do. Um, it's been 10 years, but I mean, most of it is still very relevant. And so what we are going to do is uh, we are going to watch it together and I'll be the annoying friend that just comment over the, the, the movie. So hopefully with insightful and entertaining comments. And if you are new to this channel, so I'm uh, Damien, a former commodity trader, and now I own a bunch of businesses related to commodity trading. So um, I know a little bit about the industry. Never has our society consumed so many raw materials as here at the beginning of the 20th century. The emergence of new economic powers like China and India has set off an explosion in demand. So uh, in 2023, um, now it's more India which is uh, pushing the, the market. I mean, India is really emerging uh, as a big player. And China uh, has already had its um, population peaked and India, the population is still growing. So. This scramble for commodities has sent prices through the roof to the point where, in 2008, hunger riots broke out in developing countries. But China's insatiable appetite is not enough to explain the soaring prices. Clearly, some of the responsibility must fall on the markets themselves. We can't afford a situation where speculators artificially manipulate markets by buying up oil, creating the perception of a shortage, and driving prices higher. Okay, so this is a very old uh, story. Each time there is a spike in price, it's always uh, because of speculators. Always. When the price decreases, this is not because of speculators, but when the price uh, increases, it's always because of speculators. Um, this has nothing to do with, uh, for instance, political decision that has been made. No, 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 not really. It's because of speculators. <laughs> okay, to be fair, there's a few times in history where someone really cornered the market and made a lot of money because of it. But most of the time, uh, I mean, it ends up really, really bad for the guy that wants to corner the market. So, uh, I mean, this is... Uh, what commodity traders do is really like um, taking the risk on the supply chain risk on them. Some companies speculate, most of them don't really, um, especially the small and medium one, they, they don't really speculate because they cannot afford to, to lose money. So yeah, I mean, it's easy to, to blame speculators because people love, uh, <laughs> love doing so. But in reality, most of the time when there is like an issue with the market, it's uh, because of political decision. But these speculators Barack Obama's talking about, who exactly are they? How do these famously complex and opaque commodities markets actually work? To answer these two questions, you have to speak to the leading players in these markets, the commodities traders who buy and ship the merchandise, then resell it. They're all members of an old corporation, the world of big business. The very first rule of this corporation is secrecy, and secrecy tends to feed people's imagination. Yeah, about the secrecy, this is completely true. So the commodity trader used to be a very secret uh, corporation because they made money out of those uh, information. So uh, they'd rather wanted to, to fly under the radar. And uh, now the, the com companies are, are huge, and but they still have those, uh, those secret DNA. Uh, inside them. So if you ask anyone, a Trafigura, Vital, Cargill, I mean, LDC, I mean, they are not allowed to speak. They are not allowed to speak about what they do. So this is why my YouTube channel, even though it's a very small YouTube channel, I'm the biggest uh, physical commodity traders channel <laughs> on the internet. And the internet is big. Huh? <laughs> yeah, because no no one is, um, is allowed to speak. I mean, I think they are missing the new world because now the information, the alpha in the information is not really there. So um, it doesn't really make sense. Uh, I think they would, it would be better for them just to explain exactly what they do, uh, which is uh, taking the risk on regarding the supply chain risk. And that's pretty much it. But I'm not at the, the board of those companies. So kind of 
imagination. A trader is a company or an individual who buys merch. Okay, I have like a spicy stuff about the uh, and Jack again. Uh, I, I will tell you a little bit later in the documentary, but it's only rumors, only rumors. Okay? But I have, I have a good one. I met the, the guy actually in a plane from uh, Senegal to um, to Abidjan, uh, and I and I just say hi, and I was like a, a young trader, and I just say hi, I'm Damien, and I saw you in this actually uh, documentary. Like, so this is why I knew who he was. He is a really tall guy. And he just like, yeah, he was nice. Actually, just uh, but it blew me off a little bit, and then he spent the rest of the time on on the phone. So, in order to sell it on at a higher price, it's a job where you hate risk, but our work's entirely based on taking those risks. We're not there to rob people. We're there to take risks, and if we get it right, make money. We are merchants. We make. We are market makers. Commodities traders have made Geneva the hub of their activities. It has the banks and the tax breaks, so no less than 400 trading companies have based themselves there. So, for the one that doesn't know, I'm from Geneva, so this is why uh, <laughs> I know quite well this industry. And all of that is true. Uh, Ten years ago, there were more small and medium traders. Now they almost died. So there is a bit less uh, commodity trading money, but it's still a big hub. Among them, some of the giants of the sector. Vital is the world's leading oil trader with a turnover of three hundred billion dollars. And then there's the club of four big agribusiness companies, who between them can lay claim to eighty percent of the world's grain market. They call them ABCD. Yeah, now there is Kofco also missing here, and the uh, revenue of those companies. You our web here. Tucked away in the discreet canton of Zug, the Glencore Group is as powerful as it is secretive. With a turnover of over $250 billion, it's a player on all the commodities markets. But how much do we really know about these business giants? Almost nothing. Here on the shores of Lake Léman, the commodities traders cultivate anonymity and are notoriously camera shy. The multinationals stick to their basic rule and won't talk to us. In a year-long exchange of emails, the Glencore Group will demonstrate its perfect mastery of the art of never saying no. The only company that will, through the voice of its managing director, explain its choice to remain silent is Louis Dreyfus Commodities. In the past, we have too often noticed a tendency on the part of certain people to reduce the debate to a conflict between rich and poor, multinationals and small local farmers, technology and purity, etc. I hope you'll be contributing to enriching the debate to take it beyond the usual moralizing themes, as helpful as they may be. Best regards. Meanwhile, though, other businessmen accepted to meet with us. Such as Gilles Chotard, until recently an oil trader for one of the world's biggest oil trading companies. Show me a top university graduate, a mining engineer, mathematics, philosophy graduate, and I'll show you one of the world's worst oil traders. A trader will tell you, well, this is the playing field, just go for it. Let your experience, your intelligence and your nose for risk be your guide. <laughs> and sometimes we screw up good and proper. To give you an idea, on a hundred million dollar cargo, you're trying to make a hundred million. And if things are really volatile and you make a mistake, you're going to lose three million dollars. So you're risking $3 million to make $100 million. And that's a really tough business, and only the best survive. 
According to the traders, Mark Rich was the best. It was he who, back in the 70s, revolutionized the oil business. A mythic figure in whom all the ambiguities of the profession were incarnated. Yes, I worked in his company. He was an extraordinary guy. He could speak five languages. He could absorb information and remember people and facts in the most extraordinary way. He had an instinct for risk and a talent for networking. He was our guru, really. Everyone who met him will tell you Mark Rich was a great businessman. But on the human level, well, that was another story. Yeah, so uh, about the, I mean, uh, uh, Arte, the the people that finance this uh, this documentary, it's a French or German uh, thing. So uh, this is why most of the uh, guys speak French. Um, and uh, the French are really good to, to have like ethic, you know, judgment about what other people do. To this day, the name Mark Rich is associated with a scandal that took place in the 70s. In 1978, the mullahs seizing power in Iran led first to Iranian crude oil supplies being cut off and then to an American embargo. Both economically and politically, it was devastating. Mark Rich made his fortune in the 70s by setting up trade between the Shah's Iran and Israel. But then he held on to his positions in the Ayatollah's Iran and kept trading in Iranian oil right through the Tehran hostage crisis at the American embassy. Mark Rich now found himself on the FBI's 10 most wanted list and had to seek asylum in Switzerland. Until the day he died in the summer of 2013, he would never again set foot in the United States. Clinton even gave Mark Rich an official pardon, but he never came back to the United States. I'd say Mark Rich always lived on the edge. Ethically? Ethically, well, no, he had no ethics. And he was even on the edge of what was legal and what wasn't. And also, so, um, this legal thing, so um, what was legal where? What was legal in the US? What was legal in Europe? What was legal in South Africa? What was legal in Iran? Because everything that we watch right now uh, through the, the eyes of someone from the West world. But maybe if, I don't know, some people in Russia or in, in South Korea would do this documentary again, I mean, they would have like another view of what is legal and not. So what, what I want to say is yeah, I'm not here to defend Mark Rich or whatever, but, or the traders. What I'm just saying is like there is a frame of reference when people say, oh, this is ethic, this is legal. And this is true through this frame of reference that you know that they made their judgment. But the frame of reference is different if you speak with someone in um, the middle of uh, Central Africa or if you speak with someone in Cambodia. And uh, what I'm saying, like I'm a white boy from a Western, a Western country. So, um, and usually this is the frame of reference that everyone took, it's the Western uh, view of things, but the world is way more complex than that, so. Just how far can you go in business? Between Mark Rich and Glencore lies a very shadowy commercial zone. But let's get back to basics. Traders are first and foremost merchants, and they've been around for centuries. When the Amsterdam Stock Exchange first opened its doors in 1611 in a public square, business was booming. Prices, quantities, quality, delivery dates, all the arts of negotiation were in play. years later the rituals are still in place in London for example where in the tradition of a glorious past metal prices are called out each day at auction it's a coded world for the initiates yeah, this uh, stuff I think the LME still have an open pit the LME is a London metal exchange but I feel like uh, watching a uh, I don't know, like um, farmers, like farming with their own hand. I mean, this, it makes no sense that there's still people that shout to make the market. I mean, 
So let me um, move forward a little bit. Uh, din, din, din. Yep. Here we go. Wash for here at 2.99. That's pretty much the best in Brazil right now. I can send you a sample. I think I've got some in. The Moraga, absolutely. Liquid Ambar MS. It's not rubbish. It's the real McCoy. Not Mickey Mouse. What we do is buy coffee and sell it according to customer demand. Our two main risk areas are first geographic, which means you have to know your suppliers who are selling the coffee at source. Then there's the price risk, because prices can vary greatly. That means if you've already been selling coffee to someone at, let's say, 100, and the market's gone up to 300, well, you have to honor your agreement. And that's the security we offer our client. Little bit old. Don't know what it is, but it's a bit old. They want to sell us these coffees, but there's no way we're going to buy them. Because they're no good. It's just not the quality we should expect from these coffees. It's really not what we're used to. Well, that's really bitter. No good, it's rancid. What we're really all about is the product. We know about coffee. We know how to promote it and how to describe it. We do our best to advise our customers on quality, on blends, etc. It's the product that counts. London, along with New York, is one of the two main centers of the coffee trade. That's why there are so many traders in the British capital. Tarek al Kasinda used to work for one of the biggest coffee trading companies until he launched his own business. He's passionate about the product and about the market as well. It's fantastic. You have the, the markets move. Uh, it, it's, it's really interesting. It's one of the most um, uh, volatile commodities in the world. It's fascinating. And one year you have a huge crop, the next year you have a very small crop compensated by a massive crop in that country or, or a smaller crop in that country. And all these numbers just are really interesting to play with. I travel quite a bit. I, I travel once a month at least to a producing country. See my clients, talk to them, try to do some business, see how it's going, uh, look at the crops, how they're developing. You know, I've been doing it for the past 25 years. So. So, and yes, what he's saying is completely right. You need to travel a lot in this business. I mean, you need to create human connection and so on. So there is no rare around that. Um, because at the end of the day, all the traders sell a, a price and a payment term. But everyone is within the market price and everyone uses the same payment term. So, at, so who is going to make the difference is who gets the sales. So then you need to... Um, to build relationship and relationship are not built over zoom are not built over cold relationship are built with face time for instance I, I also travel in I don't know more than 80 countries and half of them like especially the small country in, in Africa that was for work you, know, like, you, you don't go to, to I don't know Guinea Conakry uh, Conakry Guinea uh, for, for, for tourism <laughs> it's for work Above all, commodities traders are globetrotters. Business isn't just done over the phone or by computer. Armand Ezerzer is on a business trip to Taiwan. He started out in sugar and dabbled in cocoa until he settled on cotton and founded his company Mambo Commodities. He's off to meet the big cotton spinners in the south of the island to sell them cotton. He's accompanied by Apollo Chang, his local agent, and Masaoud Mama, his associate in Togo. Cotton traders are forever looking at cotton. It's hard to imagine doing this without touching it, seeing it. 
What prevents you seeing it as often as you'd like is all the office work involved. But you're still ticking all the boxes in your head. This cotton is like this, it comes from there. We're always being sent samples and checking them out in the sorting room. And that's how we keep the spinners satisfied and supply them with the cotton they want from year to year. Spinning is the starting point in the worldwide textile industry. The cotton is transformed into spools of thread to supply the clothing factories in Cambodia, Laos, Bangladesh and Ethiopia. The Ihua Company is one of the biggest spinners in Taiwan. Thousands of tons of cotton are bought every year by Mr. Tsai, who only does business with the biggest traders and is famously tough to deal with. Yes, we are handling great cotton, yes. Today, somebody called me 79.5 for the one, uh, one inch and one edge. Yeah. It depends for, for 41 or 31. You mean 41, 31? 31. Millery. Millery. Milling? Yeah, millery. Ah, it will be difficult for me to provide at this time of the year. I'm not the only one not looking for it. Uh -huh. And there is a big, big uh, premium to pay to have it. We, we have some, some strict laws. Mm -hmm. And even on strict law, this is really the, 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 the best you can find. Yeah. We ship it immediately. Yeah. We have it in... Unless you arrive in Taiwan. In yes, Taiwan. yes. But we have to agree on the quality. If you want, you have the samples here. We agree. We send you some sealed sample and it will be exactly what you are going to receive, without fail. So obviously we didn't uh, see the whole conversation, but uh, you see he's putting the on phase on the, the quality. So this is the quality that you're going to get. And I think Amon is a senior traders and he knows what is important to the buyers. I made him a firm offer. He just has to snap his fingers and it's confirmed. There's nothing on paper, but it's a firm offer. That's how it is. No need to have it on paper. And it's very misleading, because it can all seem to happen so casually. And then the deal's done, just like that. In a couple of seconds, the deal will be made, and there'll be millions of dollars in it. Because 82, that's 82 cents per pound of English cotton, which makes about $1,800 a tonne. $1,800 times 500 tons, so we're already at a million dollars just for what we were talking about this morning, for a few minutes. So there's no room for mistakes about the terms or about what you're promising, because if you get the terms wrong, there's no going back on them. It's just like in the school playground, what's said is said. Yeah, so this is what I'm gonna say is completely true. But, you know, now, um, I mean, it has changed a little bit. People like they send contract they don't fulfill them i mean we see a lot of um, new behaviors that was not really true uh, before the only people that will last are the people that will um, be extremely clear and um, do not walk back after signing contract or saying stuff so and this is the people that will last if you are around people that said some stuff and then they act otherwise uh, because maybe this is how it's done in your country yeah this is not looking great for the for the futures because at the end of the day, you, you need only need to have like a few customers, a few suppliers that you are really tight with them and you can have massive businesses. Millions of dollars just on somebody's word. That's how they do business in the cotton trade. But selling's only part of the job. You have to know when to buy. Being a trader means above all, being prepared. To be prepared, commodities traders have to analyze and interpret information from all over the world. Jack Kane is a rice trader. 
He works from Geneva, where he runs the Novell Commodities Company. Some of the major groups have research departments that keep a constant eye on supply and demand so they can anticipate the relationship between the two in the short, medium and long term. I think that's how decisions are reached. Then the results will turn out to be either right or wrong. And depending on the positions that are taken, they'll determine the profit or the loss made on the transactions. And that's what's known as feeling the market? Yes, it certainly isn't an exact science, but that is indeed what we call feeling the market. So, a few things. Uh, first one is like, yeah, there's a big group of uh, analysts, but at the end of the day, this is the traders that take the decision. And usually it's only like the head traders that really run the book. The other one, they are like, like more matron, origination, and so on. I mean, they feed the head traders of head of platform up with uh, the information that they see on the ground, but at the end of the day, he's the one making the, the shot. Okay, so okay. novel commodities. So uh, let me give you what I've heard. Maybe this is completely untrue, so please, please. Uh, <laughs> But let's say the rumors about his company. So Novel Commodities made a deal with um, the president in Liberia. And the rumor says that they agreed on a huge scam. So what happened is that they made a, a huge deal with, um, with uh, China. Uh, at the time, it was Kofco was not as big as now. So. But it was with the Chinese government and it was Kofco that was doing the deal. So they sold for millions of rice to, to Liberia. And I don't remember the details, but the thing is, um, the, the cargo were, were in Liberia under some type of uh, CMA, Control Management Agreement, or something like this, I don't remember. And basically what happened is they just steal the cargo. But as you can imagine, stealing millions of rice, I mean, it's huge. It's, uh, it's I don't know, like 2,000 trucks that needs to move the cargo and so on. And yeah, so the, the, the thing is, is like, yeah, the, I mean, the story is that um, he... Novel Commodities and uh, the, the Liberia president, uh, she, I think, uh, they just ma made a deal to, to screw the, the Chinese and stole the cargo. So I don't know how true is that. I don't know. But what I do know is like, like uh, Novel is uh, liquidated. Kofco attacked, attacked him and that, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Paul Perk is a Dutchman living in Brazil. He's an old hand at international agricultural commodities trading, and he's learned to check his sources. Information is the key. Because if one of your colleagues gives you some wrong information from China, say, telling you, for example, that China has enough corn this year to feed all its pigs and chickens, because he's been out to look at the harvests and he reckons everything's okay. But then it turns out it's not okay at all and China suddenly turns up on the market and imports 10 million tons, then that's for sure going to completely change the prices. And what happens if you haven't seen it coming? <laughs> you lose a lot of money in general. Agricultural commodities such as wheat represent a considerable gamble. The traders follow the harvest very carefully and can quickly check out whether their information is accurate. To be ahead of the game, though, you need the right contacts and a good network. In 2010, Russia suffered a terrible drought and the wheat harvest was looking like a disaster. To prioritize the needs of the Russian population, the Kremlin decided to stop all exports. Within two days, the international market price of the grain had risen by 15%. The Glencore Group found all its connections revealed on the front pages of the financial press. Right from the start, it's really been a very controversial firm, and it's often been in the news, notably in 2010, when it admitted speculating upward the price of corn and wheat. And this at the time Russia was having a drought that year. And at the same time, they publicly demanded that Russia ban all grain exports. 
Russia didn't waste any time complying. So within a few days, world food prices took a brutal rise of 30%. And that way, Glencore made a considerable profit. Okay, come on. So um, do you really think that Glencore can ask uh, Russia to, uh, to uh, halt the, the export because they are long? I mean, Russia, and Putin was, uh, I think, yeah, back then, it was, yeah, it was uh, not Medvedev, but it was Putin. You really think you can, can go and ask Putin to do something uh, because you are long uh, wait? I mean, it, it makes a sense. But what I think is true, and on the other end, is like, they knew before the other guys that, um, that uh, the Russian was going to ban. So they took massive, massive um, a position on the market. And then when the news hit, then uh, the market shoot up. Uh, shot up uh, and they made uh, millions. Um, that's 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 true. But uh, saying that Glencore like uh, asked uh, Russia and Russia complied, come on, come on, seriously, this this makes no sense. And one other thing with um, commodity trading is like there is no ins insider trade or inside trading. You know when when, uh, when if you are like CEO of a public market company, the uh, a company in the public market CEO, CFO or on the executive team or on the board, you have um, um, information that you cannot share. So then, if you leak those information, this is called uh, inside trading, I think, insider trading, whatever. And th this is not legal. But with commodity, there is like no, it's not one company that uh, export all the cotton, all the wheat, or the oil in the world. So the, this there is no rule that apply uh, like this in in the commodity market. Yeah. Si, effectivement, Glencore a su. If Glencore heard on the grapevine from its links with certain oligarchs who were close to Putin, if they knew for sure there'd be an embargo, well, that's when you take positions. It's information. It's pretty close to insider trading, but it's a worldwide market where insider trading does happen. Well, nobody's a saint. And in quite a few countries, let's not kid ourselves, it does go on. Things are corrupt. And there are some trading companies that are more or less ethical. And others, some of whom you've mentioned, who have no idea of ethical behavior. But there's a lot more to trading than this. A trader takes a chance when he buys raw materials even before they're produced. A year before the harvest, the cotton has already been negotiated. Armand Desaisers has for a long time been working with Burkina Faso, today one of Africa's foremost producers of cotton. The harvest season is starting and the producers are bringing in the crop. We'll see it better at the factory. They'll clean off all these bits here. We'll see. Armand Desaisers' business contact is Sofitex, a semi-public company that oversees and commercializes cotton production in the west of the country of 500,000 tons of cotton seed. Armand Desaisers has already bought this cotton a year before it's been harvested. He's not only bought it, but has already sold it to Asian spinners. I hope it'll be better than last year. So I don't know if he already bought it, like if he already sent a prepayment or not. Because man, if that is the case, this is uh, this is ballsy. I mean, <laughs> uh, Burkina Faso is sending a large prepayment, like years in advance. I mean, you you must know what to do. Will the promised quality be delivered? It's the moment of truth. We come here to the sorting room to see Joel and we say, right, so what are we really getting here? We have to deliver to our clients and we have to know what we'll be giving them. And you have to match the specifications of what you're selling as closely as possible to what's being delivered. 
And you'd never be able to do that without the results you get from the sorting room. The moment the cotton is baled up, the traders try to move the merchandise as fast as they can to respect their deadlines. It's all now a question of logistics, and everyone's in the same boat. Be it Louis Dreyfus, Cargill, or Armand Ezeter. They all sit there in the same chair, opposite Paul Sourabier, who controls all shipments for Sofitex. He's the man you have to negotiate with. I can start loading, but I don't know when they'll be leaving. Can you get it off by train, then? Yes, by train, no problem. I already started doing that last week. If all goes well, these balls of Burkina Faso cotton will in a few months... So you see why this is extremely important. Uh, I mean, it's a relationship-based business. I mean, Armand needs to go there to speak. I don't know who is this guy here, but if he's in charge of the shipment, I mean, he's in charge of the money. So um, you need to discuss with him, you need to be with him, you need to be friendly, you need to ask if you can go before the other competitor, uh, especially in those uh, African countries where there is like a huge bottleneck in terms of logistics. So... <laughs> Once be in the hands of the Asian spinners. From purchase of the product until delivery, the commodities traders need a lot of financing. That's where the banks come in. A bank really hates risk. A trader likes a bit of a risk, but it's something a banker just can't stand. So he lets the oil trader take the risk while the bank finances it in the background. Oil trading, for instance, has certain merits uh, such as that you typically uh, transact large tickets, which makes it uh, operationally very efficient. If you look at uh, a crude oil trader uh, uh, which, which executes transactions uh, with a typical tenor of 45 days, that means that they can turn around eight times uh, their credit line a year. Uh, so so uh, and knowing that uh, crude oil cargo is something between 120 to 250 million dollars, you can imagine what, what uh, amount of money is involved in that business. And no, I don't imagine. <laughs> you know. <laughs> but can you tell us? I mean, there are, uh, in, in, in the crude oil sector, there are companies which, which have turnovers between uh, 100 million upwards to, to two, three hundred million dollars. Uh, they're very big Billion. ones. Billion dollars, yes. Well, I don't use a lot of bankers today. I use uh, trade finance funds because the banks have had, uh, have been very erratic in their uh, relationships. When, when it's sunny, they give an umbrella, and when it's raining, they take it away. And uh, they tend to do that um, all the time. But that means that, uh, that you don't like risk, you are risk adverse, but banks too. Banks too, but sometimes you know, back in the in 2008, nine, the shares collapsed, and they didn't have enough cash to to provide uh, financing, and and it was a drama. It was horrifying. We were wondering how the world is functioning, how the trade flows are being financed. The banks cut a lot of lines to a lot of people. Did they cut for you? Uh, at the time, yes. Mm. Yes. So yes. what happened? Uh, at the time, I had to liquidate my company. Yes. So um, here about the financing, so the guy said that uh, when the bank cut uh, him off, he had to liquidate his company because he couldn't uh, work with it. And uh, this is a bigger shift over the last maybe 20, 20 years um, in commodity trading is now the banks that don't, don't lend to, to small and medium traders. I spoke with one of the big, uh, one of the biggest bank here in Switzerland, uh, commodity trade finance bank. And the guy said, look, uh, I mean, we have 50 customers. They are the 50 biggest company in the world and that's it. We are happy with them. We don't want to, to lend to anyone else. 
So, um, and a lot of uh, com banks just got out of the commodity trade finance for for a lot of reasons, let's say. But uh, now um, we are in a world where the big commodity traders, this is why also they became so big, is that now they are the ones that get all the credit line, like very, very cheap credit line from the bank. And then they are refinancing the other smaller trader. So, and they, of course, take a cut. So, uh, this is uh, the situation that we are here right now. So... That means that you cannot really compete with big traders um, on big trades flow because your cost of financing, I, I mean, as a, small, as a small trader, I mean, because your cost of financing will be higher than them. So there's like just no way. I mean, it makes no sense for you to do at that. But as a small and uh, medium community trader, you need to be on flows where banks are not really willing to finance those flows. So this means distribution at the end, maybe origination at the beginning, but the big FOB, C flows, I mean, you can most of the time forget it. I mean, there is going to be a Olam, a, a Kofko, a Vital Trafigura that is are, are going to be there and with a very, very low cost of financing and they will just beat the shit out of you um, anytime they want because they don't have the same cost structure as you uh, for that specific deals. But, you know, those big trading firms they also have like a higher cost structure um, so they need to be on flows with a lot, a lot of volume. So this is what there is still a lot of opportunity for uh, smaller niche flows uh, and where, where they are not there because for them it makes no sense. So, um, yeah, so this is what has really changed. And now the banks only finance the big one. And if you are a small and medium commodity trader, you need to get finance from a commodity trade finance fund. Um, or private lenders or I mean there's a lot of way to get finance but it's not easy you know it's not like you go to your bank and you ask for a credit line it's uh, it needs to um, it is more work on your end you need to understand repurchase agreement you need to un understand um, collateralization of your goods I mean it's more complex but but if you manage to do it I mean I think uh, you can make a lot of money uh, with a small commodity trading firm sorry was it uh, a drama <laughs> Worse than a drama, yes, yes. It was my life, yes. Yeah. Traders who love their product and their job have also for a long time had the reputation of being speculators. The history of trading is also the history of speculating. As far back as 1909, in his film A Corner in Wheat, the American filmmaker D.W. Griffith tells of unscrupulous dealings of a speculator as he makes his fortune on the back of the suffering peasants. Speculating is part of the job. It's important for a trader, and in my case, the commodity I'm dealing in is rice, to be able to foresee the rise and fall in prices. So you have to take a position and buy what you know you can sell at a profit, or sell only when you're going to make a profit. And that means speculating. They call Anthony Ward chocolate finger. He's considered to be the world's greatest trader in cocoa. In 2010, he hit the headlines when he bought almost all the cocoa stocks on the Ivory Coast, the world's biggest exporter. Just weeks later, civil war broke out in Abidjan, and cocoa prices went through the roof. Anthony Ward had played a winning hand. The wheel turns, though, and in November 2013, he had to sell his business. It's perfectly obvious that for the dominant players on the market, there's always the temptation to hold back sales in the hope that the price will rise, to buy up as much as they can to force prices up and then sell at a big profit. That's what trading's all about. Yes, uh, no, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, I don't know this dude, uh, I, I'm pretty sure he's good at Excel, but no, I mean, this. It, this does not happen. The big problem, though, is the lack of transparency. Okay, so why is it a big problem, the lack of transparency? Seriously, why is it? For, for the government? Because they want to tax shit, maybe? <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, anyway. There may be a certain discretion about the business. Perhaps companies don't share information about their infrastructures. About how many silos or warehouses they've got. But there's no way there are any hidden stocks, any Alibaba's caves hidden away in deepest Amazonia, 
That mm. just doesn't happen. Yeah, he's right. But an unprecedented revolution is set to shake up the world of trade and opening the door to an entirely different kind of speculation. You have to go to Chicago to understand what's happened at the turn of the 21st century. Both traders and producers have always sought to keep one step ahead of price fluctuations. To manage the risk, they created the futures markets. The most famous of them is the Chicago Board of Trade, a legendary center of the agricultural commodities market. There are other traders working here known as paper traders, as opposed to traders on the physical market. Trez Knipper is a paper trader. I'm watching crude oil here. I've got a big position in crude. Um, I'm also watching other markets. Um, and then I'm on Twitter, and so I will monitor Twitter for me is a good source of news because people will talk about what's going on and it'll show up. So I'll kind of keep an eye on that and then I'll make comments. Uh, there's some people that are listening to my comments um, in the crude oil and I'll, I'll kind of tweet about it and say, I think this or I think that. You know, just if anything else, it's to watch and see what's going on. At the Chicago Board of Trade, paper traders like Trez Knipper deal in futures. In financial speak, a future is a derivative product. For the traders, it's a form of insurance that covers them against price fluctuations. Actually, if the futures markets exist, it's because the insurance companies refuse to insure against price risk, and for one very simple technical reason. If you have a car, you can insure it against theft or against fire because you know how much it's worth. And the insurer, too, knows just how much a particular car is worth, so he'll insure it at a rate that he's able to estimate. He can fix the price and the amount. With raw materials, though, the margin for price rises or drops, especially rises, is infinite. So the risk isn't quantifiable. And it's because the insurance companies couldn't cover that risk that the futures markets were created. When you buy a large quantity of cotton at any given moment, you know you're going to resell it in a month or six months or in a year or two. Throughout the length of this contract, as long as you haven't sold it, you're at risk from the price. So there's a way of insuring this price risk, the financial market. So to cover himself against price fluctuations, Armand Ezezer is going to sell a future to Tres Knipa. I sold all the jeans at 120.80. In stock market language, it's known as a position. And when you're actually selling your physical product to the spinners, you buy that position back on the stock market, which sells it back to you. So, Trez Knipper is a speculator. By buying and selling futures, he hopes to make a profit while enabling the traders to cover themselves against varying prices. You good? All right. It's a time-honored custom for the producers and the buyers of agricultural products to cover themselves against evolving prices and against the unpredictable risk that entails. The speculation this involves is basically healthy and it encourages and facilitates fair exchange. But it's true that the arrival of big investment institutions, investment funds and investment banks, whose only motive in the way they approach the markets is a financial one, has twisted the rules of the game. Yes, yeah, so um, this is true that in the 08, when uh, all the prices spiked at the end of the Chinese super cycle, there were a lot of financial players that came in with like a fund, ETF trackers and so on. A uh, lot of uh, commodity um, uh, um, hedge fund that was like pure paper speculator. 
uh, but they, they basically all shut down yet. So it's been like maybe 10 years that we haven't seen like a large commodity focus uh, hedge fund uh, really making money. And most of them are just uh, shut down. But that's changed. Like last year or two years or so, uh, we had like a spike in volatility again in the commodity market. And there were like a bunch of um, big money managers that uh, uh, quickly set up uh, hedge fund to, to capture those, uh, those volatility, this volatility and poach a bunch of uh, physical uh, commodity traders. I think I made a video about that. Um, so now we see hedge funds back on the commodity market. But is it going to be as big as uh, the last wave 10 years ago? I don't know. But in a nutshell, there is way less financial payout now than it used to be. In the year 2000, the internet bubble had burst and IT stocks had collapsed. And investors turned to the commodities market for new sources of profit. The big banks and the pension funds like CalPERS, which alone handles $280 billion, started mass buying futures. Commodities prices soared. These days, we just don't know what the big funds are up to. Why do they suddenly turn up on the market and invest billions in sugar, for example, or oil or soya? We can't know why they do it, because they have such wide portfolios that they have to invest a certain percentage in soya, a certain percentage in coffee or in sugar, in gold, in oil or in currencies. And with all the money they've got, well, it all comes in at once and the market just can't control it. They say to the manager of CalPERS, look me, if you don't bring in a 12 or 14 percent return on investment, you're fired. And the CalPERS guy, he's going to raise the stakes. And of course, then the trader doesn't have a chance, because he's dealing in physical commodities, whereas the sheer volume of paper trading has become much more important. Traders who are employed by investors have a know-how that's very adaptable. They're just as good on the stock market as on the metal or oil markets. And if you take a trader who's working in wheat, for example, and you move him over into oil, he'll be fine. Because it's probably going to be the same tools he's using. And that's because he's not dealing with the fundamentals of the market. He's using mathematical tools. The latest development in this new virtual world of trading is the creation of computer bots programmed by algorithms. Yes, so I'm going to fast forward a little bit because now it's everything is a little bit outdated. I mean, we have ChatGPT today. I mean, come on, <laughs> the computer bot on things called the internet. <laughs> Yo, let me, so, um, yes. So then this, yeah. So basically now what uh, they're saying, if, if I remember well, is like uh, physical traders could be extremely hurt by the, um, the financial players because when there's like a spike in the market, which is driven by financial um, uh, momentum, like for whatever reason, or the guy in New York think that, uh, I don't know, cotton will go up. So they put a lot of money behind cotton, cotton spike in price. And what um, Armand is explaining, if I remember well, is that for them, it's for the small and medium community trader, it's awful. Because if you remember at the beginning, he bought the, his cotton a year in advance. So that means that he has hedged his position and he also sold. So that means that if the price jump, and he is hedging, um, he's losing, he could use millions and millions on his hedging uh, part of the deal, even though he would make this, uh, this part uh, on the physical side. 
the, the bank which is lending the money for the hedging is going to call up, hey Armand, uh, this is a uh, time for you to, to put more money um, in, your, in your bank account, otherwise we are going to liquidate your position. And then you lose everything. So basically he, when the price uh, do something completely uh, stupid for whatever reason and traders are hedged, they are losing so much money on the edge that they need to and they get magic gold like daily. Um, so this is when uh, our company can, uh, can blow up. Look at this Excel, Excel guy. <laughs> uh, din, 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 din. What matters to us is the volatility, the movement of prices. So even as we're Obama, what bothers Mr. Obama is that he has no control. He's faced with five or six trading companies based in Switzerland that are totally private and who do business with whomever they want. So this has changed. Now, do you really think that they can do business with whoever they want? It's, uh, it's getting more complex. It's getting more, more complex. So the politicians, they are, they are winning this, this battle. And then I think this is why we will have way more volatility in the futures, because there is going to be more extreme geopolitical event and which will drive more volatility. And at the big commodity traders, um, one day they will have to align, you know. Are you with the West? Are you with the, the BRICS? So maybe this would be the end of the big uh, traders that can play on all the sides. And if I do a little bit of story, this is why uh, Switzerland became the, the biggest uh, hub. Uh, and then they were also neutral. So during the Second World War and the First World War, even though Europe was like um, uh, bleeding, uh, Switzerland uh, maintained it, its neutrality. So this is why everyone came here to, and I say here because I, I'm, now I'm in Geneva, Switzerland, um, to, to do business. So because in Switzerland, you could do business with the, the Russian bloc, the URSS, and it was impossible to do so um, from the US. That's what Cargill moved here and all the other traders moved here. Um, but, but now it has changed because um, the Swiss uh, government chose to follow the, the EU uh, regarding the, uh, the sanction on Russia. So basically, so all the Russian uh, traders moved to, to Dubai. And um, Russia, I think the Swiss company used to market 80% of the Russian crude. So this, this is gone. Uh, everyone moved to Dubai. And Dubai is a new place where you can deal with all the blocks with, without problem. But it was really the, the nail in the, in the coffin, uh, if I would say, because um, it was already extremely difficult, difficult to deal with certain countries because the bank were not willing to follow you if you had to deal with uh, Sudan, with, uh, with complex countries, uh, and so on. So, um, so it was already going the down road for Switzerland and now with um, this sanction on the Russian interest um, I mean yeah everyone just uh, left to Dubai so this is why Dubai is booming uh, yeah. the CFTC the American market authority has regulatory measures for speculation intended to limit the interventions of pure financiers yeah okay so this part is, again is less interesting because this is a let's uh, i mean this is futures book <laughs> I mean, but they speak of the future market which is not what i'm i mean i don't think i have a, like a really interesting comment to say about it uh and also the futures markets have changed a lot uh the last 10 years whole livestock represents today a huge market in 10 years its production has almost tripled The farmers have become real businessmen. In the Rio Grande do Sul, in the south of the country, Pedro Luis Herter runs a medium-sized farm of over 10,000 acres. He may continue to work with the traders, but these days he has ways to cut them out. That's right. We're in great demand by Chinese companies to directly export soya. But the distances involved make it quite complicated to guarantee both delivery and the quality of the merchandise on arrival. It's true. So basically, what he's saying is that the, the customer has needs, demand, and stuff that um, the farmer the, <laughs> doesn't want to, to comply with. So this is why there's traders in between that uh, make sure that the product arrives on time, at the quality, and with the payment that the, the buyers want. 
So and this is why there is still traders, you know, because they take all the risk and organize that um, something that the farmer doesn't want to, to do, or maybe they just can't do it, you know, because if you have even if you have like a huge farm, I mean the traders have the possibility to buy from uh, all the fir- the farms in the world. So this is why they can do that. Uh, what a, a solo f- a farmer can't. Um, also, also this is true that um, now the industry is getting more integrated vertically. But then when you get more integrated vertically, you are more subject to the price of the commodity. Because commodity are the idea is that they, they are not, uh, if the price goes up or it goes down, I mean, for them, they play on the differences, so they don't really care. But if you get more integrated uh, vertically, then you do care about the price of the commodity. So then it changes your, your shift, it changes your business model. So. And I think there is like no definite answer what is the best. Do you want to be vertically integrated like um, Sokar? I don't know if you know Sokar. Um, so uh, here in Switzerland, they have like a pump for then you can buy oil. And I think it's a, a company from Azerbaijan. Uh, and they have also um, uh, oil, uh, oil well in Azerbaijan. So though they are fully, fully integrated, you know. That when it comes to that, the traders are really good for our peace of mind. I think the big companies could now deal directly with the Chinese, but not the small or medium-sized businesses. They won't have the means. It'll just be too expensive for them. In fact, what the Chinese want is to get away from the Chicago stock market prices. What they usually do is ask me to fix a price that's lower than the stock market price. So that limits our possibilities. What we're doing now is exporting directly per container. This is new for us, so we'll see how it goes. This direct dealing between producer and importer is still suffering from numerous logistical problems. At the moment, the Brazilian port of Santos, where the soya is loaded, is overstretched. But this kind of initiative looks like the economic model of the future. The big producers are intending to become traders themselves, and the traders producers. Yes. A market trend that may well even further sideline the small farmers. I don't yeah, believe that uh, uh, what uh, you know we will be facing uh, in the future is that producing uh, companies, upstream companies, will create their own trading outfit in, in, in countries like Switzerland. And in fact, this is exactly what has happened and uh, what will continue to happen. I think uh, it's a poor man's business today to be a medium-sized trade house or a small trade house. It's very difficult. You have to have very niche markets. Yes. Some of the, we do the unwanted business that the big boys don't want to do. Exactly. The future belongs to the big conglomerates that represent the whole sector. In Geneva, AB... Yes, but this is true. I mean, it was true 10 years ago. This is still true to that. But I'm not sure that in the future, if the geopolitically, uh, I mean, the big companies will be as free to do business as they, as they could right now. I'm not really sure. And this might be the downfall of all those big uh, commodity tra- trading houses. Like the government are going to say, look, guys, now you need to choose. Do you want to deal with China? Do you want to deal with Russia? Do you want to deal with the US? Do you, do you want to deal with Europe? Then you need to to do that. And then... Um, they would need to, to follow what the government uh, wants. So would it mean that they are going to be smaller? I, I don't know. I don't know. But the only downfall that we will see for those companies would be it, like uh, political reasons that make them part of their business because they are just not allowed to, to do business anymore. ECD have become producers, industrialists and financiers. For example... Cargill, for example, was the first of the four to set up an investment fund called Black River Asset Management, whose job is to... Yeah, so Black River Asset Management is now closed because they... <laughs> all the hedge funds backed by commodity traders like, like um, the, this one, uh, they, they are all closed now because it worked. I think, I think it worked when there's like a lot of volatility, but when the volatility is done, then... It doesn't make sense. Speculate on the financial commodities market, both for the parent company and others. So these companies are also selling financial services and speculating directly on the agricultural commodities financial markets. ABCD are very good at both jobs. 
and their directors keep all communication to a minimum. They don't want people to know about them. They have no interest in that. All it would bring them would be criticism. Why call it publicity? I don't imagine for a minute that people would like to hear that, let's say, A, B, C or D are making something like $5 billion a year trading in bread or cooking oil or, or chicken or beef. These trading giants may look right now like masters of the universe. But the history of trading is littered with seemingly invincible empires like theirs that through their own arrogance have been swept away by an indifferent market. Even so, one thing won't change. It's the traders who keep on making the world go round. It's really not the issue as, as far as trade is concerned. Well, it's a good cotton. I mean, the color one is very similar to the American cotton. Mm -hmm. And the color, color is uh, the top correct. Yep. Okay, guys. So I hope that you liked um, this uh, this video and this comment on the video. Um, yeah. Do, did you like it or not? Just let me know in the comment. If you are still there after like more than one hour, so that means that you kind of like it. Uh, and then I will try to do more, more commentary about uh, stuff. Like if um, it proves to be of interest to you. Ciao, guys.